I haven't heard much about the Flatwoods Monster case. As I was growing up in ufology, I first got interested in 1958, and I'd heard about it and read about it in some encyclopedias and so forth. But it was only when Frank Faschino called me to appear at their 50th anniversary celebration in Flatwoods that I looked a lot more closely to see what do I want to get involved with here. I mean, is this real? Is it not real? Is, is it just a story? I was very impressed with what I found. So I agreed to go down there. And I was astonished in talking with Frank. And he was sending me material. And we spent time together at the 50th anniversary to see the enormous amount of information he had collected. And when talking to the witnesses, I, mean, I believe you have to go to the site if you're going to learn something useful about a case. It's very helpful. So with Flatwoods, being able to walk the walk that the kids took going up the hill to see the big tree, to see the area where the saucer had landed up above, as soon as you saw those things, you, you've got a very important context for the story. And that's what had been there. It was the highest place in the area. So whoever was running the darn thing would look around and say, hey, we'd better put it down there. There's no place else. We're in bad trouble otherwise. So that made sense. That place made absolute sense. And then when you go up the hill to go past the tree, what's left of it, the family, the people had gone up past and the monster came out from, then you could again understand they're going up there to see what's up there. They have no expectation at all of running into something over here, especially some, some monster, some different thing, some totally unexpected thing. And so when you start looking at this, and you talk to the witnesses, and you find out that the kids got sick, got a whiff of this crazy gas or oil or whatever it was, maybe the two together, uh, and how they understood it could make kids sick. And the kids were sick all night long reporter found that out. When you hear about what uh, the National Guard guy, uh, Dale Levitt, found, it begins to really pile up facts and data and information. And then when I read the Air Force explanation, gee, no surprise there, it was just a meteor. Well, meteors have certain properties. They move very rapidly. When they hit the ground, there's a big noise and usually a big hole in the ground, and there are remnants of the meteor. None of these hold true. Meteors don't circle around the city and come down and land. You could say, well, it just went down the other side. But that wasn't what the people perceived. And when you hear the explanation, not only was it a meteor up there, although there's not the slightest bit of evidence that there was. And if you look at the meteor compilations for that year, no Flatwoods meteor. And when you hear about the monster and then the stupid explanation, that it was an owl. I mean, a big owl. Real big owl. And if the kid's getting sick, it uh, was because they were frightened. None of that makes any sense. Look at that. Here's the monster owl. Here's the monster. You know how high the branch was up here? when the skeptics put out drawings, of course, they got the branch down here. But the object couldn't have moved out if there was a branch in the way. It went under the branch that was maybe 12 feet off the ground. So I don't know what this thing was. I suspect it was protective gear being run by somebody, maybe even remotely. And these seem to be antennas. Now, people were misled by the initial drawings that were put together uh, as to what this was. But it's remarkable when you look at the five drawings made by the five kids who were up there, and the local reporter had each kid do it separately. And you see how alike they were. Standard legal procedures say if five people describe something the same way, then they're probably describing the same thing. And, you know, this is impressive for five different kids. And this is peculiar. Nobody's ever reported a, a cow like a bear as, like, 
ace of spades, you know, a spade behind something. Uh, this is not like they copied it from a science fiction magazine. So you have an honest reporter who actually was willing to go on television with the kids and Mrs. May, primary witness. Now, I was favorably impressed with the witnesses, too. I get a real kick out of the people who attack witnesses, but don't talk to them. Make up explanations. You know, they were just seeking attention. They wanted to be somebody. The attention UFO witnesses get is not usually very pleasant, especially in a small town. They get laughed at by the people in the community. These kids had nothing to gain. Mrs. May had nothing to gain. Though they went on television, big deal. They were being accommodating to a local reporter, Mr. Stewart. And when you attack the people's credibility without giving any good reason for doing so, and you, when you ignore the data, and when you refuse to go to the site to see things firsthand or to talk to the firsthand witnesses, that's what Dr. Joe Nickel did with regard to this case. He was in Flatwoods, but he didn't go up to see the hill or the gully where the thing moved down. And he didn't talk to the witnesses, and he didn't go to the tree. What kind of investigation is that? One of the major contributions Frank Machino has made to the investigation of the Flatwoods Monster case is to dig out the Blue Book files. Difficult as it was, they were hard to read. But you look at all the witness testimony from that time. You know, people saying it was not a meteor. I have seen meteors. Uh, People who haven't seen meteors might think it was, but I have seen meteors is clearly being flown. That's a quote from a witness. Obviously, the craft was in trouble, or it wouldn't have come down up there. They seemed, saw it as kind of burning. So you got to go down, cool it off. It, it's amazing uh, out there on the site, you see how steep the gully is. The terrain is rugged. It's not gently sloping hills. The thing slid on down, this object went back there, and the whole thing took off sometime later. Meanwhile, lots of information was collected, which we have never seen. And Dale Levitt pointed out he never got any feedback on the stuff that he sent in. He sent in samples of the liquid, samples of the metal. Nobody knows what happened to it, where it went, and what the results were. And that's what I think happened here. And I think the government was, the guys on the inside at the hub, were very much concerned about what this meant. In the first place, people were scared all the pieces. Monster, that conjures up all kinds of things. And in the second place, what does this mean? Are these guys here to destroy us? Were they getting ready to attack? You know, the imagination plays tricks. And if you talk about a 12-foot high monster, that is scary. And so you can understand the government's concern with not making any more out of this story than they had to. It's part of the job of the government to prevent public panic about things, to tamp down too much excitement, because it gets in the way of getting rational things done. So I'm not blaming the government entirely for lying about this event. What are they going to say? That wouldn't scare the heck out of people. Are they going to tell you about all the other sightings that night? Of craft moving across the country from the East Coast over? Don't think so. But Frank Faschino has collected the stories from the newspapers all over the East. And it is clear there were lots and lots of sightings of truly unidentified flying objects that were not meteors. So Flatwoods is a good, solid case. Frank Faschino has collected more data on that case than has been collected in any other case that I'm aware of. And I've been on Roswell for 25 years. Frank has found the gold.